whenever we, we talk about um, areas related to salvation, oftentimes we get into two different positions. And based on oftentimes how you were raised, uh, the type of church you were raised in, you're either going to be more um, Arminian or more Calvinistic. And um, all churches, basically pretty much any church that's evangelical, and even Catholic churches, which are not evangelical, fall into one of these two camps. So I just want you to know that Catholic, all Catholics are Arminian. Okay. So just at the outset, um, this is the this is pretty much the Catholic position, Arminianism. And um, so Calvinists tend to be any church that's reformed. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of the Reformed churches, like the Episcopalian Church, for instance, has gone pretty liberal. Um, but those who have studied theology, <laughs> that conservative or evangelical theology in the past, and the Episcopal Church would be Calvinistic. Uh, Presbyterian churches are Calvinistic. Uh, Lutheran churches can be either. Actually, it's, it just sort of depends on the church. Methodist churches would fall under Arminianism. Um, and, you know, Baptist churches can go either way. So, so anyway, just um, I, I want to at least do an overview of this just to sort of um, get some parameters or like a, a bigger view of how the atonement fits in. Because he talks about this at the end of the chapter um, in reference to limited atonement and unlimited atonement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so I just want you to, I, I want you to just see, uh, briefly cover this. Um, you'll notice that for Calvinism, this is an acronym, okay, TULIP, which makes it sort of easy to remember. So I always start with TULIP first because Arminianism really doesn't have an acronym. So they have points as well, but they're not, they haven't been put in a formula or in an acronym like Calvinism. So the points of Calvinism, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the points of Calvinism. Calvinism we're talking about TULIP. And what's interesting about TULIP is Arminianism was actually considered, was considered on whether or not it was biblical or not. And they had a council in Dort in Holland, and it was condemned as heresy. Okay, and you can read about that if you look at the Council of Dort. You can just type it in Wikipedia and read it. I don't know how accurate it is. You know, you, you have to take Wikipedia with a grain of salt, but uh, depending on who wrote the article, sometimes it's accurate, sometimes it's not, but that'll, you know, do something for you as far as that goes. Um, so real quick, I just want to explain the differences here. Uh, tulip, again, the sort of the flower that you think of when you think of Holland is the tulip. And I don't know who came up with this acronym. I, I bet if I did research or you did research, you could probably find out who the first person was that came up with the idea of tulip. But it was sort of this acronym to combat the points, the main points of Arminianism. And so what are the points of Arminianism and then what are the points of Calvinism? And I'll explain each one just, brief, just quickly. But first of all, for Arminians, they think that you have total free will with regard to your salvation. Um, and, and so basically this, this means that you're... There's the fall, there, there was a fall, but it didn't affect you that bad. So that a non-believer actually has the spiritual ability to respond to the gospel of their own will. Whereas for the Calvinists, they say, no, you're born dead in sin and you do not have any ability whatsoever to come to Christ left to yourself, that you're dead spiritually. So here you're pretty much alive spiritually to some extent, but here you're dead spiritually. So you have no ability unless God intervenes. And so this is where uh, regenerate, like I, I believe strongly that regeneration precedes faith, that uh, the non-believer cannot exercise faith without being regenerate. Whereas they believe that you exercise your faith and then you're regenerated. Okay? So, so that's, 
uh, a big difference. And as a matter of fact, most Calvinists think everything, basically everything from here goes downhill this way. Like every point follows this. And this tends to be, honestly, it's just, it's very man-centered. It's, it's looking at things really from man's perspective. Trying to understand things really from man's perspective. As a matter of fact, most Christian philosopher, philosophers today, not always, in the past they've been Calvinists, but in recent times, most Christian philosophers today, like Norm Geisler, uh, J.P. Moreland, um, uh, pretty much any philosopher today, it tends to be Arminian. Um, that, and a lot of these guys are apologists. Whereas this tends to be more God-centered, really looking at it from God's perspective. Okay, the, the second point would be that election, our election is conditional from the uh, Arminian side. So, for instance, when it says in... Um, uh, hold on a second. When it says in Romans 8 that um, whom God foreknew, he elected, the way they interpret foreknowledge is that God had the knowledge that because you had free will and you exercised that free will and someone shared the gospel with you and you exercised your faith and then you were saved, God saved you because you exercised your free will, you chose him, and because you chose him and he saw that you would choose him, knowledge-wise, that he elected you based on the condition of your faith. That's the way the Arminian teaches that. For the Calvinists, they say no, uh, and, and the primary passage they would use to explain this is Romans uh, 9 where Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. And then he explains that it wasn't before they, you know, it wasn't because they did anything. It wasn't because of the order of their birth. Or what, you know, it was just, I chose to love, have a love relationship with Jacob and not Esau. So unconditional election means that it's not, his election of us isn't conditioned on what we do. It's on who he chooses to have a love relationship with. Okay, this one is the one that we covered in this chapter pretty extensively, and they would say that um, the atonement's unlimited. We're going to spend a lot of time on this today, so I'm not going to tackle it too much here, other than to say that this one, this point, there's a lot of people who call themselves four-point Calvinists, and where they get off the boat here on the five points is this one that um, Dallas Seminary, for instance, Dallas Seminary, one of the most famous seminaries in the world, probably the second largest seminary in the United States still, most of their professors hold to unlimited atonement, but they hold to, they hold to these points, but not this one. And they would articulate classical unlimited atonement as specified by Jacobus Arminius. Okay, but we'll, we'll tackle that quite a bit, so we'll talk about that. Um, then they would say that the grace of God is, can be resisted. That the offer of salvation goes out to everybody, but in and of yourself you can resist that offer. Um, now, Calvinists wouldn't disagree with that, but what they would say is if God, again, if the starting point is you can't be saved in and of yourself and you're spiritually dead, you're not going to be saved anyway unless God makes you alive. And how does he make you alive? He regenerates you. So if he regenerates you, you can't resist that regeneration. That's something he just does. It's just like our birth. You know, how many, how many of you made a decision to be born? None of you. And being born again, it's, a, it's the exact same. It's, you didn't choose to be born again. You were born again. And God's the one who did that. You didn't choose for your parents to have sex when they did nine months before you were born. But boom, you're born. And you had nothing to do with it. Now afterwards, you have everything to do with your decisions. But before that, both spiritual birth and physical birth are basically exactly the same. You have no say in the matter. <laughs> okay? And then perseverance of the saints, they would, Arminians teach you can lose your salvation. Okay, if you can... If you have the ability to get saved in and of yourself, you also have the ability to desave yourself, to lose your salvation. So these churches 
are very commonly give altar calls every week. If you're in a church like this, I've been in churches like this, you'll see the same people going forward all the time, you know, because they, they were saved last week, last Sunday, but they de-saved themselves on Monday. Um, and then now they're going forward again. And so they'll use terminology like, um, you know, I'm recommitting my, all the time, I'm recommitting my life to Christ or whatever. Uh, again, because there's a sense that salvation really depends ultimately on you. Whereas here, it all depends on the Lord. So Calvinists talk about the perseverance of the saints. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Why? Because God, you're regenerate. You can't be unregenerated. Once you're spiritually alive, just like once you're physically born, you can't be unborn. You're, you're alive. I mean, you can die, but you can't undo the fact that you exist or you existed. And so, so anyway, in my, I am totally a Calvinist. I mean, I'm 100%, 110% Calvinist. <laughs> but I know that some of you might hold to some of these points. And I'm not going to die on this hill. I mean, I, I'm the type that I had to wrestle with this myself. I think most people by the, in default mode tend to be more Arminian. I think you tend to think you have something to do with your salvation and um, the way general evangel uh, evangelicalism is in America. Most of the radio preachers are Arminian. Most of the churches are Arminian. So the ethos of our culture tends to be Arminian. And, um, and, but again, for me, I'm very, I could never be a part of an Arminian church. I just, but personally, I couldn't. So that's why I could never be a part of a Calvary chapel. All Calvary chapels are Arminian. They're very anti-Calvinistic. Um, but I don't mind. We have people that have a Cal Calvary chapel background in our church, and they don't get too bent out of shape because we go verse by verse exposition. And the reality is a lot of, even, Armen even though they're Arminian and they're trained as Arminian, a lot of Calvary chapel uh, churches they're going through the book of John, which is very Calvinistic. They're going through Romans, which is very Calvinistic. Ephesians. I mean, all the verses that this stuff is based on are in John, Romans, and Ephesians, pretty much. And it's sort of hard to get out of this if you're just going verse by verse. But as a theology, they, hold to, they pretty much hold to this. And they're pretty strong in that. And it's because Chuck Smith even wrote a book that was very anti-Calvinistic. And so Chuck Smith is the Pope in the, um, in the Calvary Chapel movement. He just is, you know, because he's the first Calvary Chapel pastor. But anyway, I like Chuck Smith. I mean, again, I disagree with him on this. But and, and one of the things I tell people all the time is like, I would much rather, there are Calvinists that are sort of smug in their Calvinism and they don't do evangelism. And well, if God's going to save people, then I don't have to do anything. And I have a word for that, a Greek word, balonios. OK, uh, we have a responsibility to declare the gospel. I think it's a mystery how God does this. But I believe this is what the Bible teaches. At, but at the same time, I don't get a pass on evangelism. And you'll, you know, every Sunday I share the gospel. Mm -hmm. Every Sunday I share the gospel. I give an opportunity to respond to the gospel. But I know, I, I believe that if anybody does respond to the gospel, it's because God regenerated them. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not... Um, so anyway, I'm very strong on this, but I allow people to wrestle with this. And if there's, there are people, I know there's people, there's probably people here, and there's people in our church that hold to more of an Arminian position. But if they're around very long and they're listening, they're going to hear a lot of this come through just because we're teaching the Bible. And it's there. Okay? So I don't make any bones about being a Calvinist. I think, unfortunately, sometimes Calvinists get a bad rap, and it's because of Crummy Calvinists, okay? There are crummy Calvinists out there that are smug in their salvation. They don't do evangelism. They're not passionate to reach people for Christ. So I always tell people I'd rather be around an evangelistic Armenian than an ivory tower Calvinist any day. <laughs> and a lot of times when I've been on mission trips, a lot of the people I'm with are more Armenian because they feel, the one thing about Armenianism is you feel the weight of responsibility in reaching people for Christ. Um, because again, they have the ability, so I just need to tell them. 
If they have the ability, that means they can receive it or reject it, and I'm going to get it out there. So I, 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 th I think nowadays that it hasn't always been the case, because Jonathan Edward, the last Great Awakening in America, the two biggest evangelists during that time were George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, both very strong Calvinists. When George Whitfield was asked, how do I know that somebody's saved? He said, just wait about six months. And what he was saying is, if they're saved, they're going to bear fruit. If they're not saved, they're, you know, they're not going to show fruit. And they're still lost and they never got saved, is what he would say. But Calvinists hold very strongly to perseverance of the saints because just like being born physically, when you're born spiritually, you can't be unborn spiritually. Okay? All right, any questions on this? Yeah, there may be a lot, but I don't know. Any do you need any clarification or any questions? Oh, we got it. You got it? <laughs> okay, close your books. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting. Okay. Yeah, and again, we'll get into more of this. Um, we're going to do a few more chapters on related to election and predestination and so forth. So we'll cover this again and we'll go through this again. But, um, you know, this is something worth watching. For me, the best book on this topic, hands down, is R.C. Sproul's Chosen by God. If you've never read Chosen by God, if you're just going to have one book on the doctrine of salvation, Chosen by God. Yeah. I, I just think it's, it's easy to read. He's such a good communicator. It's written for lay people. Um, it's very clear. He answers the objections. Um, I, I mean, I pretty much agree 110% with everything he writes in that book, and I think it's biblical and it's theologically sound. And, um, and I've read the, the, you know, if you want to know what some of the better Arminian works are, I can give those to you as well. Probably the most famous is Grace Unlimited by Clark Pinnock. Uh, as far as a modern day um, defense of Arminianism. What's interesting about Clark Pinnock is, is he became an open theist. Uh, we talked about that already. Open theism is, is that God doesn't know the future. Uh, which again, it's just sort of, it's a st like, I mean, my view is anytime you get away from sound theology, it leads to heresy. And what's interesting is a lot of Arminians in historically, as a matter of fact, my top 10 and most theologians, top 10 theologians all fall under Calvinism. John Calvin, obviously, Martin Luther, um, Jonathan Edwards, Augustine was pre-Calvin, but he would hold to all these points biblically. Um, honestly, you can't name a single great Arminian theologian. They don't exist. And that should tell you something. Um, but, interesting enough, the, the most staunch Arminian theologians of this century, uh, by and large, have become heretics, and one of them would be Clark Pinnock. Clark Pinnock, at the end of his life, denied the inerrancy and infallibility and authority of scriptures. Uh, he became an open theist, and uh, that led to all kinds of problems as well. He was actually kicked out of the Evangelical Theological Society. But he would be the guy who wrote the textbook on modern Ar Arminianism. Can you tell me why does limited atonement fit within the Calvinist? It doesn't. Oh, why does it fit within the Calvinist yeah. position? Well, again, as, you, as we saw in the book, uh, it doesn't fit the acronym, but most Calvinists, like myself as well, I like particular redemption better. I like the idea of particular. In other words, did Jesus just die willy-nilly? You know, I'm going to die and I hope that people get saved. Or did he die specifically for the elect? And I think the Bible clearly, there's a lot more verses that specify that than the other. And he deals with that. So we'll read some of that in the chapter here. But, but again, these all sort of go together because if salvation depends on you primarily, well, your free will, your, the condition of whether or not you respond or reject to the gospel, um, Jesus died for you, but you got to accept that. Um, you can resist 
God's offer of salvation. You know, you have the power to resist God, which to me is ridiculous. How can any puny human resist God? But they, they got to deal with that. I mean, that's what they say. And then that you can lose your salvation because if it's up to you to be saved, it's also up to you to keep your salvation as well. So this is very man-centered. It just is. There's no way out of it. This is really God-centered because I, I'm dead spiritually, so who makes me alive? God does. Uh, I, I don't have the power to elect God, so who elects me? God does. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't ask Jesus to die for me, but he died for me, and he says he died for me. He died for his sheep. Who are his sheep? The elect, the ones who've been made alive spiritually, the regenerate, the born again. So he died particularly for me, for the elect. Um, can I resist God's offer of salvation? No. I want it. Why? Because he changed my heart spiritually. Now I desire what he desires for me. And then because he began my salvation, God, when God starts something, he always finishes it. He doesn't procrastinate. Uh, he doesn't put things off. He doesn't blow it. He does not hold the covenants. He doesn't get divorced. Uh, when he marries you, you're married to him for life eternal. So all this, God gets the glory. All this, man gets the glory. So... You know, drop the mic. <laughs> you know, I just like, again, I have a really hard time with this. But again, if people want to believe any of this, you have to be able to defend it biblically. And I don't think any of it can be defended biblically, ultimately. Uh, especially when you compare the massive amount of scripture there is for all of this. There, uh, there are plenty of books on this, on the five points. And literally hundreds of verses that support each of these points in the whole Bible. If you try to find the same thing with Arminianism, you can't find it. Because they don't have, they, they have a few scriptures they'll use, like for God so loved the world. You know, they, they use the term world and, and that type of thing. But again, you have to take that in the context of the passage that's being written. One of the most famous passages uh, is in Peter, and Peter's talking to God is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to salvation. Well, the context of that is the elect. Who are the all? The elect. So again, in almost any p passage that any Armenian will throw at you, and I've debated Armenians my whole life. As a matter of fact, my best friend was a hardcore Armenian. Now he's a more hardcore Calvinist even than I am. You have to be a Calvinist to be a member of his church, actually. You can't even be an Armenian and, and be a member, but I don't go that far. Um, I, I just think that, you know, if people want to believe this, again, to me it's important. The primary thing is most Armenians and most Calvinists will share the gospel exactly the same. And to me, the important thing is that people are sharing the gospel. Billy Graham was an Armenian, uh, and I, I love Billy Graham. Uh, he's in heaven, you know. Um, interesting enough, he, he said publicly his daughter was a better theologian than him, Anne Graham Lotz, and she's a Calvinist, and he's right. <laughs> she, is a, she is a better uh, theologian than Billy was. But, but Billy, no doubt, had the gift of evangelism, and God used him, you know. Um, so anyway, I'm not, a lot of Calvinists are really hardcore. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's funny, I'll, I'll just say this and then we'll get into the chapter. Um, when I, I went to uh, Talbot Seminary, which is at Biola University, and Talbot probably, I'd say most people at Talbot are more Arminian. Um, there's probably 60% Arminians and maybe 40% Calvinists there because a lot of generic Christians go there. I mean, people that go to non-denominational churches or churches, again, most churches in America are more Arminian in their theology. So a lot of people at Biola, by default, are Arminian. Um, but what's interesting is if you in the lounge at Talbot, the three years I was there working on my MDiv, I was a youth pastor, and youth pastors always wear shorts. You could tell who a youth pastor is. Youth pastors wear shorts. Anybody who's not a youth pastor wears pants. I mean, it's just hands down, it's a fact. If you wear shorts, you're a youth pastor. If you wear pants, you're something else. Um, but anyway, you could always tell who the youth pastors were, and, the, and all the youth pastors are talking about their outreach. What are you guys doing for outreach this week? You know, what, what, are, you, what are you guys doing? For, and, and again, very, evan Whoa, my thing again. Um, very evangelistic, very focused on reaching lost people, discipling people that get saved from those outreaches. Um, and I like that. I, I liked, again, about sort of, 
you know, maybe 60% Armenian, 40% Calvinist. Most of my youth pastor friend, I, one of my best friends in, at Talbot was more Armenian. But we did a lot of stuff together. Uh, and, and, and another guy, actually two of my best friends were both more Armenian. Great guys, I'm still good friends with them. They're senior pastors now, but they were youth pastors at pretty big churches and we did a lot of events together. We did, every year we did a heaven and hell seminar that we'd have like 500 high schoolers at. I'd always speak on hell, uh, which probably doesn't surprise you. Um, he would speak on heaven, I would speak on hell, and we'd have like a rock band there. And, um, anyway, we had a lot of, uh, did a lot of out outreach stuff together. So at Talbot, the whole time I was there in the lounge, everybody's talking about evangelism. Everybody's talking about outreach. Everybody's talking about reaching people for Christ. Then I work on my doctorate at Westminster Seminary, which is like as reformed as you can get. Okay. There, nobody's talking about outreach. Everybody's talking about sound doctrine. And Rick Warren is, is you know, a heretic, and so-and-so is a heretic, and everybody's a heretic, you know? And it's all sound theology, and, and the tenor is very serious and very hardcore. And I'm not to say they're still that way or whatever. I was, I, I got, I did all my doctoral work there. All I had to do was write my dissertation. I could not wait to get out of there. Okay, and no offense if anybody from Westminster Seminary is watching on video. <laughs> I learned a lot of good stuff there. Um, but it's almost like, honestly, it was almost like more of a pharisaical mindset in the Reformed Seminary, whereas the Talbot Seminary was more, how are we going to reach people? And honestly, I prefer this. I, even though I, don't, I disagree with the theology, but I'm just as evangelistic as any Arminian I've ever known. I mean, I'm always sharing the gospel. I love to share the gospel. But again, my mindset is, I know this person can't respond unless God awakens them. Okay? But I still do it. I don't know who's saved. Charles Spurgeon was a Calvinist, and many people came to faith through his ministry. And he said, man, wouldn't it be great if every single elect person had a yellow stripe on their back? And you could just say, can you turn around and you know, lift up their back? If they had a yellow strip, you keep going, you know, because you know they're one of the elect. And if they don't, you just, well, oh well, you know, they're, they're not one of the elect. But we don't know who the elect are. So we're to share with everybody. Um, and I think this issue, as far as what's clear, and he talks about what, what both sides agree on, and I like that. I like the fact that he does that. He says, here's what we agree on. Let's focus on that. And the reality is the apostles themselves didn't make, they didn't talk. Calvin and Armi Jacobus Arminius and John Calvin didn't exist, okay, when they wrote the Bible. But these are categories that were both sides, both theologies used the Bible to prove their points. So I think it's a good, it's a good valid system that really exists. In other words, it's not a myth, it's not abstract, it's not just made up. Gosh, I'm having a hard time with this, this thing. I'm wearing a collar next time. That I, anyway, um, but, but one thing I just want you to know is that if you read your Bible, you're going to believe that only God saves. You're going to believe that you plant seeds. You're a, you're a farmer. You're a gardener. Uh, this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. He says, you know, I, I watered, you know, so-and-so watered, you know, I planted. God's the one who brings the harvest. And both Arminians and Calvinists agree on that, you know, that we have a different understanding of who's going to respond. But the reality is I don't think the gospel changes. I am also very careful. I, I, will, use, I will use Jesus died for you, but... Um, again, I think that offer goes out to everybody that Jesus' death is, the way I look at it, it's, it's, uh, it's sufficient for everyone. In other words, the only way anyone's going to be saved, uh, well, ultimately, is I believe God has to save them, but the content of that is you have to believe that Jesus died for you. And I believe that Jesus died for everyone in the sense that his death is the sufficient means for anybody who would be saved. But I also believe that if his death is efficient for everyone, that means everybody would be saved. And that's what Grudem talks about in the chapter, is 
He said, you know, ultimately these guys can't get out of the fact that everyone, and that's what Clark Pinnock ended up believing when he died, which is inevitable for an Armenian if they're going to be consistent. If they believe in unlimited atonement, then they believe that the gospel, that everybody ultimately is going to be saved because Jesus died for everyone. So he covers everybody's sins, whether you believe in them or not. And I think that's unbiblical. That's, a, that's an unbiblical point. Because who are the ones that saved? Those who believe. You have to believe. So, it, you know, but if Jesus died for everyone, what would even be the point of us being commanded to evangelize? You know, if everybody's just saved, then we could do whatever we want. You know, studying theology is a waste of, well, it's not a waste of time, but... But again, I think a big motivator for us to study the Bible and study theology is how to better share the gospel with, with lost people. Um, so anyway, um, a, lot, a lot of stuff to talk about there. All right, did I answer your question? I don't even know, I don't, I don't even know if, I don't know if I answered your question or not. Long tangent there. But I'm pretty passionate about this subject, I mean, if I was teaching at a seminary, this would be my favorite subject to teach, uh, the doctrine of salvation. Okay, um, we are on page 121, um, again, covering the atonement. You probably were pleasantly surprised that the workbook um, wasn't as difficult as the chapter, in the sense of it covered sort of more of the easier stuff. It wasn't that difficult. It wasn't that, it didn't take that long, hopefully. Uh, but the chapter itself, I'm sure for many of you was uh, challenging. You know, just a lot of information, a lot of theology, a lot of uh, different topics that he covered. So, uh, but hopefully it was helpful. Hopefully you found it helpful. Okay, first of all, what was the um, definition of the atonement? Uh, the work Christ did in his life and death to earn our salvation. Okay, good. Yeah, and again, why, why is both the balance of his life and his death important for our salvation? So let's, for, let's first look at his life. Yeah. What was essential that he did in those 33 years that are essential for our salvation? That he lived a perfect life, yeah. perfect obedience to the Father. Yeah. And again, you know, he didn't live a long time, but when you look at his life, when you look at the impact of his life and what he did, um, especially in just three years of public ministry, uh, the effects of that are bigger than the effects of any other human that have ever, that's ever lived, no matter how long they lived. So sometimes people say, well, you know, I could have made it for 33 years. And I'm like, yeah, right. You know, um, but I've heard that. I've, I've had a few people tell me that, you know, he should have lived longer. You know, I don't, I don't think he lived long enough. I don't think he was tempted in every way as I am. He wasn't tempted as an old man, you know, for instance. And, um, but I bet you he looked old. I bet you he looked really old, um, especially on the cross. I mean, I, I would imagine the transformation. And we've all seen that, people that get sick. I mean, even people that get cancer, even young people. Uh, people get diseases. I, I've seen people in their 20s that look like they're in their 60s or 70s. Um, so anyway, uh, my view is that he did go, it, he, he had to live enough as an adult to be able to experience what all adults experience. But I think it was sort of like supernatural formative processes for Jesus where he went through everything quicker than we do, uh, even the negative stuff. Um, Anything else about his life that had to happen? And again, that gets, this gets back to our, chap, our last chapter, too. This, our last chapter, the person of Christ, covered a lot of this. I think there's some other things that are important, too. Oh, he had to uh, suffer. He had to learn obedience through suffering. Or is that the same thing as we were just talking about? It is. Well, yeah, I mean, I th again, I think it's, there's a holistic element mm -hmm. of his life, you know, that involve his emotions, physical development, intellectual development. 
the different kinds of temptations you face as a child, a teenager, an adult, um, yeah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's both the not sinning, but it's also I think the attitude, and and specifically, he had to bring glory to God in everything. Mm. So it's not just not doing the sin; it's also doing the right things with a right attitude. Yeah which is I'm doing everything for the glory of God. And, you know, we can do good things. You know, there's pagan. A lot of pagans are doing good things every day. They're driving the speed limit. You know, they're not stealing. But I, they're not doing that for the glory of God. They're doing that because they don't want to get fined yeah. or they don't want to, you know, they don't want to go to jail. Um, but they're not doing it for the glory of God. So Jesus did everything right, but he also did it with the right motives, and, and he did it for the glory of God. I, to me, that's the most remarkable thing. Because, you know, you put somebody, like, I went to Christian schools, and I think in a Christian, you still get people that are rebellious in Christian schools, and people that don't want to be there, and people that are there because their parents are hoping that that, that school will reform them or change them, even though their hearts still wicked. <laughs> they think that just being, and it might help being around people that are more righteous. But the reality is like, I went to a Christian school. Uh, we had 50 people in my graduating class. At our 20 year reunion, we had 10 people show up. And those were the only 10 because all of us knew, all of us had contact with some of the others. But out of fi a graduating class in a Christian school, very strong, Christian school as far as the teaching went and the morals there. Um, but 40 of those students were not walking with the Lord and in total rebellion in many cases um, with the Lord. There's no guarantee that being in a, a good environment is going to change your heart. Um, only, again, you have to be regenerated. God has to change your heart from the inside out. Um, but again, that's, that's the amazing thing to me is that Jesus, you know, those students did the right thing to not get expelled or they didn't get caught. You know, some of them I know did a lot of bad stuff and they just didn't get caught. But they signed documents that they were going to obey the rules and during school hours, pretty much they obeyed the rules. But when they were on their own, they did their own thing. And that just shows you the state of the heart. They didn't do what they did for the glory of God. Um, and that's the way the Pharisees were, too, because they obeyed all these rules. But Jesus said, man, if you look at the inside of you, <laughs> it's pretty bad. <laughs> and it was. So anything else about his life? I, I think he came to also draw focus himself <clears throat> as the, uh, the source of life, source of truth. Um, I, I like what... Um, that one situation in John 3 where Nicodemus, the high priest, comes to Jesus and yeah. starts eyes him. And then part of Jesus' answer, <clears throat> it's in verse 10, is, is, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and, we, and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I told, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No, one's except, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Okay. And like, it's like he, he's the focus of um, what God's been trying to, what God wants to tell us. Yeah. And it, you know, he, it's like he, he came to be this teacher who knows what he's talking about because right. he came from heaven. Yeah. No one else could say that. Yeah. And again, I think that, you know, what I would take from what you just said is one of the big reasons that part of, part of salvation isn't just, you know, if we just got, if it was just about being saved, there really wouldn't be any other reason for God, for God to leave us here. He'd just save us and take us home, you know, get us out of here. But we're left here after salvation. So then the next step is, okay, how do I live as a Christian? And again, the, the best way we know to live is to emulate Christ. So in other words, he left us an example. So we see his life, 
and what he did in his life and how he treated people and how he responded to believers and non-believers and legalistic people and rebellious people. And, um, so in other words, we, we have a biography. We have four biographies in the Gospels that show us how to live a Christian life by a perfect Christian. Um, and then his teaching on top of it. So we have his lifestyle, but we also have his teaching. So we really have everything we need to know based on what he taught, along with the rest of the scriptures, because God is the, is the author of all the scriptures. That's why I'm not crazy about red letter Bibles. It should all be, it really is all red letter, okay? It's all from God. Now, they do that to say these are the words specifically of Jesus while I was there, so I get that. But I think it's some, sometimes uh, certain people think these words are more important than these words. Mm -hmm. And no, they're all important. It's all from God. But the other thing is not just you know, what he taught. It's, it's also learning principles about his life, of how to live the Christian life once you're saved. Um, now, that doesn't have to do so much with our salvation, but again, our salvation is, sometimes our salvation is a process, sometimes it's instantaneous, that's arguable, that's debatable, I think, because everybody's testimony is different. And some of you have no idea when you were saved, some of you know exactly when you were saved. But that doesn't mean that if you don't remember the exact, like I'm saved, I mean, I'm I'm absolutely positive I'm going to heaven if I were to die right now, but I couldn't tell you the time or the day that I got saved. I remember praying a prayer with my mom. I don't remember when it was, okay? I was six, so it was in 1971 at some point, and I remember getting baptized in 1972, but I couldn't tell you the dates of either of those. But the effects of those are real. You know, what I believe then, I believe even more strongly now, uh, but I couldn't tell you the exact time. So, um, so anyway, the, the atonement, though, I don't think is only for salvation. It also is how do we relate to God? You know, the fact that he did atone for us and make us one with him to have fellowship with him. How do we do that? How do we live that way daily? And our salvation is a, we don't work for our salvation, but if you are saved, you have a salvation that works. Okay? And that's what James says. You know, um, James isn't contradicting uh, Paul about justification, but he's saying if you're justified, that means you're going to have fruit. That means works are going to flow, Christian types of works are going to come out of your life because you're a Christian. And if that doesn't come out of your life, that is a good indicator you're probably not a Christian. No matter what you've said, or raised your hand, or prayed a prayer, or whatever. You're either regenerate or you're not. You either have the Holy Spirit in you, and you're, and you're spiritual alive, or you're not. And again, I think that gives credence to the Calvinistic view. Um, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't come and go. You know, he, okay, I've had it with you, I'm gone. You know, no, he, you were never there. He was never in you. You know, if you're not walking with him now, you, you were never walking with him. You might have been around him and around people that walked with him. And that's what I think Hebrews is writing about in Hebrews chapter 6 and 10 is, you know, people have been enlightened, they've been around the truth, been, they, but it never says that they were saved and then now they're not saved. It just says that there's people that, are, that have more light exposure than others. If you go to a Christian school, th those kids that went to school, there's some, some of those kids went to school with me for 12 years. They, they heard the gospel every day. We had Bible class every day. We had chapel three times a week. Every single chapel speaker shared the gospel. You know, three times a week um, in the Bible every day, memorizing scripture every day. But again, if you're not saved, if you're not regenerate, it's in, the, you know, in one ear and out the other. It's, it doesn't connect with the heart. And so, you know, you can't make somebody get saved, no matter how smart you are, no matter how many answers you have. Um, that's why I feel for parents like me who some of your kids are walking with the Lord and some of them aren't. But 
I don't know that I would have done anything differently at all. I shared the gospel with all of my kids. Uh, I taught, I, I discipled all my kids. Um, I modeled, I think I modeled the Christian life well. I think I love them well. But some chose, have chosen to follow the Lord and some haven't. Why? Because some are regenerate and some aren't. I can't regenerate them. So, anyway. All right. Uh, number two. Uh, what two attributes of God led to Christ coming to earth and dying for our sins? Love and justice. Yeah. So, how would you explain the love part? <clears throat> that he made us for um, fellowship with him for all eternity. And, um, well, I was just starting yeah. to get into the justice part. Of it. Yeah. Um, and so, what, what and would be. Took uh huh. In order for that. To yeah. So what verses would you use to talk about the love of God? About the fact that, um, for instance, Jesus was, was sent for us. For God so loved us, he sent us only to God. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So John 3.16 is probably the most famous verse. Uh, what's Romans 5.8 say? But God demonstrates yeah, his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So again, it's a specific verse that says we were his enemies, we were sinners, and God rescued us. Why? Because of his love. Not because we were good. As a matter of fact, we were bad. <laughs> we were rebels, we were his enemies, but God sent his son for us anyway. And um, yeah, so, so that's his love. Now justice, on the other hand, um, what verses talk about that that was necessary for Jesus to die for our sins? The witness of sin is death. <coughs> Uh, well, but how about the justice part? Yeah. Somebody read uh, Romans four twenty four and twenty five out loud for us. You have it there, Cindy. Oh, you were looking up something else. Can somebody look up Romans four twenty four and twenty five? But for ours also, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Okay. So what would that verse have to do with justice? That he paid the penalty for our sin. Yeah. So in other words, there was a penalty that somebody had to pay. And God would be unjust if you let that, you know, if you, if you let that fine go unpaid, justice has not been served, right? So Jesus, pay, and again, there's a lot of verses. I mean, these are the kind of verses that are important to memorize. So it's important to have a plethora of scriptures in your head because again, most people today, people in America, emphasize the love of God. Uh, God's love, you know, you could do whatever you want to do. You could change your sex, you can have sex with anything you want, and God loves you just the way you are. No, He doesn't. No. He does not. <laughs> have you read your Bible? Okay, He hates sin. And Sin, you know, because he hates sin so much, that's why the, you know, the death of Christ is so gruesome. Because our sin is gruesome. And God takes it seriously. And so, I, you know, it, it drives me nuts when people think God owes them salvation. No, man, if you get what you're owed, you're in big trouble. And you better realize how holy God is uh, and just God is, and you're in big trouble. 
And I, I make no bones. As a matter of fact, the older I get, the more hardcore I am in sharing the gospel with people, that especially emphasizing their sin mm -hmm. before a holy God. Because if not, you know, again, everybody just thinks by default, I was born in America, so when I die, I'm going to heaven. Yeah. And why would you even want to go to heaven? You, you, want, you don't want anything to do with God now. Why would you want to spend your eternity with him, you know? But again, they're not thinking of it that way. They're thinking of it more like the Muslim, where you get all these pleasures and, mm -hmm. you know, they just think, I'm going to be rich and I'm going to have a mansion and whatever. But whether Jesus shows up or not, they could give a rip. Uh, but the reality is the default mode of every single human being is a one-way ticket to hell because of our sin before a holy God. And um, anyway, yeah. Yeah, the previous chapter of Romans might be even better. Um, Romans 3, beginning verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Yeah, so 323 to 326 there. Um, yeah, and again, there's a lot of passages just like that, but that's an excellent one. Uh, again, showing that, and again, we need to use that with people today, especially, because it used to be, the average person out there felt some guilt and felt like they were, you know, they did some wrong. Now most people think they're really good. I mean, people are incredibly virtuous because they wear masks or they've had the vaccine, you know. Um, and, they, you know, people just think they're so good because of whatever. And the reality is, no, you're really bad. <laughs> you know, no matter what you do to make up for what you've done that's bad, the reality is when you compare yourself to God, I, you know, you're, you're a lot worse than you think you are. Uh, everybody is. And, and so anyway, I think it's really important that we, that we know a lot of Scripture that ties the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man so that people see their need of a Savior. Most people don't think they need a Savior because they think they're good. So it's really important that we let people know how bad they are <laughs> and that we include us in that. You know, that's really important, too. I mean... I always tell people, you know, um, you know, if you knew everything about me, you probably wouldn't be listening to me right now. And I don't think I'd be listening to you either. We're, we're really bad. We've done a lot of bad things. We've had a lot of bad thoughts um, and, and done a lot of bad things. And if we knew all of those things about each other, we probably wouldn't want to have anything to do with each other. <laughs> And I think that's true. I think that's really true. If any of us had a screen, if any of us were sitting here and we invited everybody we know and, and God said, I'm going to show a video of, er of your whole life, we would be mortified. All of us would be mortified. And if you say you wouldn't be mortified, you're a liar. Okay? Because you should be mortified. Every thought you've ever had, everything you've ever done, I mean, we'd be in trouble. And God knows all that. You know, and, and, and if he's going to be just, that means he has to punish all of that. Mm -hmm. So when you're a Christian, the beauty is that he takes care of all of that. But if you're not a Christian, you're going to pay for all of that. And we need to let people know that. That's half the gospel is the justice of God, the holiness of God. And then the other half, of course, is the love and, and the forgiveness and so forth. But, you know, again, without... You know, without the justice, honestly, the, the love isn't... I, I think a lot of non-believers, they take, they take the love and the grace of God for granted. But the reality is if they knew their true state right now and what God really thinks about them right now, man, alive, they'd be repenting pretty quick. Uh, but again, they, they're only going to do that, I think, if they're, if they're made spiritual alive. Right now, they're so spiritual dead, they don't, they don't see it at all. Okay, um, okay but I yeah. Want to say, even a child understands justice because if their sibling doesn't get punished in the same way the, that they got punished for the right. same offense, it's not fair. Right, right. right. You know, and, yeah. and they lose respect for their parents. Yeah. Right? Uh, you're, you're uh, what, what would be the word? Um, you know, arbitrary. Mm hmm. And. There's no, yeah, okay. so that's... Yeah. 
but they love them more when they respect them more for their consistency. Yeah. So it's... Yeah. No, that's true. Yeah, R.C. Sproul has a great example of this in one of his books. I can't remember which one, but he talks about when he was a professor at a Bible college and um, he had a pa there was a paper that was due at mid-semester and several of the students were, were complaining because they weren't able to get the paper done. And, and, so, he said, and so he said, okay, I'm going to give you one more week to turn it in. And then at the end of the semester, they had another paper due. So anyway, he gave him grace. You know, he, he, he gave him grace. So at the end of the semester, half the class, this was only like, a, you know, maybe 20% of the class. At the end of the semester, half the class, because he did that, didn't turn in their paper, thinking they were going to get another week of grace. And he said, well, he goes, you flunked the class. And they were complaining and whining. And he said, that's justice. You know, you got what you deserve. You, you were supposed to turn it in last time I gave you grace. And he used it as an opportunity to teach about the gospel, too, that a lot of people are going to say, oh, man, why, how come I don't get more time? How come I? And he's like, you got exactly what you deserve. All right, number three, uh, Christ's active obedience was what? Christ's obedience. Christ what? Obedience. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, his righteousness. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think righteousness is um, is important. It is an important word. We don't use it very often. I think part of it's because we sort of rebel against the uh, idea of being a Pharisee. You know, self righteousness. But the reality is, the goal of the Christian life is to be righteous, and that means. We're never more like God than when we're righteous. You know, when, in other words, we're never more like God than when we do things, not just obedient, but righteousness conveys that you do what you do for the glory of God and you always do the right thing. And I think we should all strive for that. Um, again, not so people will look at us or anything. It's, it's just God saved us in order to be like him. And so our goal should be to be men and women who are righteous and strive for righteousness. Um, so again, but Christ did that perfectly for us. And therefore, because uh, of the atonement and he propitiated the wrath of God that we deserved, um, we have his, his righteousness because that's what he said. <laughs> that's what he promised. And that's really good news for us. All right, number four, why did Jesus need to live a life of perfect obedience for us? Because of the failure of Adam and Eve. Mm hmm. Okay. So it was the only way to make us righteous. Yeah. Yeah, so ultimately we're all born in Adam. Again, totally depraved. By the way, totally depraved means you can't do anything good. It means that with reference to our salvation, we're so fallen that we can't, we can't be saved without God's intervention. Okay, that's, that's what that means. It means that you don't have any moral ability to, to be saved. God's the one who makes us moral because of, you know, he, he's, he, ma he awakens us spiritually to that reality. Um, number five, Christ, what obedience was his blank for us? Yeah, passive obedience was his... Suffering. Yeah, either suffering or dying. I think those both, both work. He, he said both in the, in the chapter. Um, so what is... Passive obedience, and you could either put his suffering for us or his dying for us. And again, how would you explain that to somebody? What does that mean? What's the difference between his active obedience and his passive obedience, in a nutshell? Well, he submitted to his crucifixion. Um, 
Yes, in other words, he didn't resist it. He didn't resist yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he didn't fight it. You know, he, he was passive in that. And again, it's a good thing because if not, there'd be no stuff. So again, both those things are essential for salvation. And everything we've talked about right now, the love of God, the justice of God, the life and death of Christ, the passive and uh, active obedience, those are all good things to include when we share the gospel with somebody. So they get a good picture of, of what's going on, what their need is, what God's like, what they're like. These are all good things for clarity uh, when you share the gospel with people. Okay, page 122. Number seven, what does it mean that God imputed our sin to Christ? Okay, let me, let me put it this way. If, if Christ had never come, what's our problem because of Adam and Eve. Our sins are our sins. Yes, yes. So, yeah, so what we have in our standing before God without Christ is a lot of sin. <laughs> Both, you know, the original sin, we're born with a sin nature, but then we've also actively sinned, and we haven't given glory to God either. So what we're imputed with at birth is a sin nature. So we're already guilty before God. Now, Christ comes, and then he says, what does it mean that God imputed our sin to Christ? Well, the guilt for our sins was thought of by God as belonging to Christ, not us. Yeah, God. yeah, which is <laughs> insane, you know? It really is. It's, it's really amazing. And again, I, I, I can't remember who was, I was talking with somebody about this, about uh, Jesus saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, when he's quoting the, the Psalms when he's on the cross. But yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's amazing, you know, for, for the father to treat the son as if he were you or me. Yeah. But not just you or me, all the people that he's dying for. Um, that's a lot of sin. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of evil. And to be seen as that evil one by a holy God who, who has to punish that. Wow, what an amazing thing. Okay. That Jesus knew that was going to happen from eternity past. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, you can't yeah, and to still it. volunteer to do that. Yeah, I know. It's amazing. Holy Spirit, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, number um, eight, what's propitiation? One of my favorite words, my two favorite theological words are aseity, the self-existence of God, and propitiation. Uh, but how did he define propitiation? A sacrifice that bears God's wrath, so mm -hmm. that God becomes propitious, or favorably disposed towards us. Yeah. To pay the penalty for our sins. He was our substitution, and Christ took that upon himself. The sufferings were necessary to pay the penalty for all of our sins. Okay, good. Yeah, and a simpler definition he had in the back on this was a sacrifice that bears God's wrath to the end, mm -hmm. in so doing changes God's wrath towards us into favor. Mm -hmm. And I like that because... Um, that's one of the prayers I pray for you, you know, for you guys when God brings you to mind. Um, but people in our church, I always pray that God would give us favor with non-believers, so that even though they disagree, that hopefully we're living lives in such a way that um, they like us. We have favor with them. Because again, somebody's not really likely to lift, listen to you if they don't like you. <laughs> So even if they disagree with it, and that's the way C.S. Lewis lived. He lived in such a way that even atheists wanted to take him out to lunch after they debated him because they just really <laughs> liked him. And that's, that's what I hope for all of us is that even though we disagree, they can't refute our character, our integrity, our lifestyle, mm -hmm. so that hopefully we can have a relationship with them where there's, we have some favor with them. But what a wonderful thing that, that we have favor with God because of Jesus taking upon himself our sin. All right, number nine. 
Uh, yeah, sure. Um, does it, is there an aspect of that, that, um, that Jesus' sacrifice was acceptable to the Father because of, in degree, like uh, it, his suffering was proportionate to the sin of the world. In other words, if we paid two bucks for a speeding ticket, it wasn't. It wouldn't be uh, propitious. It, it, it's not an acceptable. It doesn't. It's not. It's not um, uh, proportionate to the offense. Is there a part of that that Jesus' suffering was so great? It was proportionate to the, and it was, therefore it was acceptable to the Father. It, it had to be. Yeah. Yeah. It had to be. Whether we understand it or not is a whole other story, but, yeah. but yeah, because the Father accepted it, it had to pay f fully for all of our sin. So, in that sense, yeah, it's it, it's perfectly just, and Jesus did exactly what he needed to do to mm -hmm. to make the payment for our sin. Yeah. Okay, number nine. Uh, explain the term penal substitution. Christ in his death for the just penalty of God for our sins as a substitute for us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. So the just penalty, so that penal part, penal substitution, um, he bore the just penalty of God for our sins as a substitute. So that, that's what you were basically talking about, Gary. Yes. Um, yeah. And again, we, we take this by faith that, that it's true. Okay, match the aspect of Christ's death with our need that we have as sinners. So sacrifice would be what? We deserve to die as the penalty for sin. Yes, and then propitiation. We deserve to bear God's wrath for our sin. Yes, and then reconciliation. We're separated from God by our sins. Right, and then redemption. <laughs> We're in bondage to sin and to the kingdom of Satan. Yes. Okay, good. All right, and then we get, we get to uh, one of the issues we started with, um, limited and unlimited atonement. Um, so what's the what would be the definition of limited atonement that he gave? <sighs> that Christ died for particular people who he foreknew individually versus the Christ died for the whole world. Okay. Good. And then unlimited atonement? Christ died for the whole world. Yeah. yeah. And again, the way he had these in the back. Um, by the way, anytime there's a, uh, anytime there's a term, all of them, there's a glossary in the back that has all of them. So it's like you have, ever have a hard time finding those there's a glossary in the back. Um, but limited atonement is primarily what would be called the Reformed view, that Christ's death actually paid for those whom he knew would be saved. And the atonement is fully effective for particular people. And then unlimited atonement, which would be known as the Arminian view, is that Jesus' death actually paid for the sins of all people who ever lived. Okay. All right. Any comments on either of those? How about, you know, the book talked about the descent into the hell. Mm hmm. Yeah. Oh, my. So <laughs> it's so confusing because. Yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah. Because I heard that. Again, I mean, somebody told us in the senior luncheon, when was that? Two days ago? Somebody asked me why we don't use the Apostles' Creed on Sundays. And we've done it before, but when we do it, we have to, we have to take two phrases out. Uh, Catholic Church, just because, again, when, when the phrase was used, and, and what they mean by that is just the whole church, the, the universal church of believers believe this. But 
when we, if we ever say Catholic, we think of Catholics, okay? That's just, that's the way the word is used in our culture. When you, th when you say Catholic, that's opposed to Protestant. Yeah, you're either a Protestant or you're a Catholic. And so that's one of the reasons that I don't like using it, because then if you take it out, you're always going to have people that grew up in the Catholic Church or they grew up in more of a Reformed or liturgical church and then they get mad because you took out Catholic. Then the other thing is that phrase, he descended into hell. And again, the reality is that phrase just isn't used in the Bible, so it's confusing. And I think that's the main point. You know, even if you didn't get everything he said there and all the different interpretations, whatever. To me, when something is not a biblical term or not even a biblical concept, why use it? So the main takeaway from that, from that whole section, is it's such a debatable topic and subject. Uh, and what was Christ doing? Ultimately, we don't know. You know, he gave a few different views on that as far as who was he preaching to? Was that referring to the people back in the time of Noah? You know, that's the view I, I hold to his view. And Wayne Grudem actually wrote arguably the best commentary in modern times on First Peter. He, um, he did his uh, THM thesis on Peter. Uh, so he's, and as a matter of fact, he's the main translator of First Peter for the ESV, the English Standard Version that we use. He was the main, every book had three translators. It was a team of three translators, and then they had an editor for the New Testament and an editor for the Old Testament. But Grudem actually is an expert on First Peter. And so he's done a lot of study on this, and I, I hold to his view. He, in, his, in his commentary on First Peter, he tackles this, and you thought this was long. He wrestles with it in over 100 pages in his commentary. So it's a... He does a very thorough job of it. But yeah, the takeaway on that, Supan, bottom line, is I think um, we, don't, we don't really know exactly what that means. There, there's too much debate on that. And the reality is it doesn't affect anything that much, one way or the other. But uh, most evangelical scholars tend to hold to what Grudem holds to. I hold to the same view that it's talking about um, the days of Noah from the context of First Peter. It's in First Peter, and so he's using that as an illustration. The, the day of Noah that people are not believing? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's an illustration of um, just the, the, the preaching that was done in the days of Noah, and then how that ties into what he was doing when he died, there's all kinds of uh, speculations. But we don't know. We just don't know. It doesn't say. It doesn't really tell us. So anything we'd say would be speculation. It's a lot like the issue of what happens. Are our souls, do we, have, do we wear clothes in the intermediate state? Do we have temporary bodies? The Bible doesn't say. There's no verse that says, in between when we die and the resurrection of our body, we have a temporary body in Hezekiah 14.6, you know. No, there's no verse that tells us. So all we can do is speculate. What we do know is that there's the martyrs in Revelation are wearing robes, and that's the intermediate state, because they're saying, how long, O Lord? He describes them as wearing robes. So I think we can speculate that those people who are already there have a temporary body. But can we prove that? No, we can't. So I, that's what I think. I think that. I think we have some kind of temporary body. If, we have, if we're wearing a robe, I can't imagine why a spirit would need a robe <laughs> and what would, the, what would hold the robe if there's no physicalness. Mm. But again, we don't have our bodies yet. Okay. So we're spirits. So I don't know. It's, 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 Christ risen, we, he has a new body. We well, Christ has his resurrection body already. But, we, but like people that we know, you know, we all know people that have died and gone to heaven. Uh, they don't have their bodies yet. Okay. You know, when I always cringe. I hear pastors say this all the time. So-and-so is up there playing baseball now and he's running around. It's like, don't you read your Bible? <laughs> you know, I mean, they don't have, they're not resurrected yet. 
Their body, I mean, we could go dig up their body right now. You know, I mean, boom, there's the bones. Jesus' bones aren't here because he has his resurrected body. But the rest of us, when we die, our soul goes to be with the Lord, but our body is here until it's resurrected. So it's just. When is the time resurrected for us? I think it's going to take place at the rapture, before the tribulation. But some Christians hold that there is no rapture. There's a second coming after that. So we're going to go through the tribulation, and that's going to happen at the end of the tribulation. Um, post. Well, that would be post-tribulational. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But again, I, I hold to. A, a rapture. So I think we're going to get our resurrected body. So if Jesus came today, our bodies, would, we haven't died yet, so our soul and our body will be united, but also we'll have new bodies. We'll have our glorified bodies at that instant. So I'll have I, these, you know, <laughs> get rid of, I'll have hair again, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Uh, what's your biblical support? For that? <laughs> I speculate on, on that. Yeah, I can't imagine a glorified being glorified and bald. I mean, <laughs> uh, there'd be something wrong with that. I can see with a <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions on limited and unlimited atonement? And again, this is one, if you hold to unlimited, again, I still like you. I, I, I even love you. I, I understand why people hold to this. But my biggest issue with this is if you really, is, okay, if, in what sense is Jesus' death unlimited? Um, is it particular? That's why I like particular re redemption, because Jesus says, I lay my life for the sheep. Okay, well, who are the sheep? He doesn't say, I lay my... I, I mean, I think if it really taught unlimited atonement, it would say, I lay my life down for the sheep and the wolves. Mm. He doesn't say that. He's very specific. Um, and in John 6, which precedes John 10, where Jesus says that, John 6, says, no one can come to the Father unless the Father draws him. So, do I really... Can I really come to the Father unaided? Um, well, Jesus said no. You know, no one can come to the Father. Um, in John 3, you know, Nicodemus, what must I do to be saved? You can't be saved unless you're born again. In other words, he wants to do something to be saved. That's religion. How can you be saved? You've got to be born again. It's, it's a mystery, okay? It's a mystery. But the reason I believe, like my oldest brother doesn't believe. He was, same home, same gospel, same parents. We heard all the same stuff. He totally rejects the Lord. I love the Lord. Am I smarter than him? No, I think my brother's probably smarter than me, okay? Uh, but he doesn't, he can give a rip about God. You know, he, he has no interest in the things of the Lord. Why? Because he's spiritually dead. Why do I have it? Because I'm spiritually alive. Was it anything good? At, you know, is anything better in me than him? No. We're both sinners. We both deserve hell. But God rescued me. God saved me. God made me alive spiritually. Uh, can that still happen for my brother? I sure hope so. That's what I'm praying for. Um, so, but again, I just think that this overestimates the ability of man and underestimates the ability of God. That, ha I think, has it right. Man, <laughs> mankind has no ability and is dead in sin and trespasses. Ephesians 2. That's exactly what Ephesians 2 says. How is anybody saved? Ephesians 2, 4. But you've been made alive by the Spirit. That's regeneration. That's being born again. How does somebody go from being totally depraved to totally saved? God. But God, because of his mercy, made us alive while we were dead in our sins and trespasses. I, I just think you see, you see all of this everywhere in the scriptures. I think you see glimpses of this. But again, when you take these, any of these, any of the passages that are used for any of this, when you take it in context, 
and then you compare it with the overwhelming verses for Calvinism. I just I just don't don't see it. Yeah. So with unlimited atonement, mm -hmm. if everyone would have mercy. There would be no justice. Yeah, I mean, again, I just think that, again, in what sense did Jesus... I, I, the way Calvinists, most Calvinists will put it, is Jesus' death is sufficient for everyone. In other words, if anyone's going to get saved, it, the atonement has to be applied to them. But what the Bible clearly teaches is everybody isn't saved. As a matter of fact, it's not even the majority of the people are saved. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. Um, narrow is the road that leads to eternal life. So, uh, again, but ultimately, if anybody is saved, God's got to do it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's based on God's mercy. I will choose who I'm going to choose. I'm going to have mercy. God says that. I have mercy on whom I have mercy. So it's not based on, and it doesn't have anything to do with our faith, anything to do with our works, none of that. And if we exercise faith, it's because God gave it to us. That's what Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says. This is not of yourselves. What's not of yourselves? The faith, even, isn't of yourselves. I gave it to you. So, so again, everything, I owe everything. I, I stand before God one day. Why should I let you into heaven? Because you saved me. <laughs> you had mercy on me. Um, you, made, you made me alive spiritually. You, you unconditionally elected me before the foundation of the earth. Jesus died on the cross for my sins specifically. Your grace was irresistible. Why wouldn't I want it? And you're the one that I'm here because you preserved me. And you get all the glory. Now, it's pretty simple. So, all right. Uh, we're already at 10, but let, let's quickly go through some of these critical things because I think these are pretty good. Uh, the, uh, number 12, explain the respective roles of each member of the Trinity in the atonement. So what was the role of the Father in the atonement? Send his son to die for us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he's the sender. He's the architect of it. You know, the, de the designer, the planner, the architect of it. How about the sun? That's the most obvious. <laughs> Pay the penalty for our sins. Right. Yeah, I mean, he, he volunteers to come. He comes. Again, the two sides of the coin. He, uh, obedient, you know, active obedience and passive obedience. Um, and then the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? The whole, again, the Holy Spirit is the Rodney Dangerfield of the Trinity. He gets no respect. <laughs> but again, if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, um, everything the Father did and the Son do would still be pointless. Okay, why? What does the Holy Spirit have to do in order for us to be saved? He has to convict us of our sin. Okay, so we have to be convicted of our sin before a holy God. What else? That just shows us we're sinners and we need a savior. What he else does he have to do? Faith. And before that. Before that. Before faith. Well, he's our intercessor to take us to uh, yeah. the living spirit within us. Okay, so the interceding of the spirit seems to come after our salvation, according to Romans eight. Mm -hmm. But again, what does he have to do? We, we're convicted of our sin, so we're spiritually dead, and then we realize we're spiritually dead, and then what needs to happen? He has to make us spiritually alive. Exactly. Okay, so regeneration. Okay, so again, if, if the Spirit does not regenerate us, if we're not born again, regeneration, born again, same thing, synonymous terms. Okay, it means the exact same thing. No one gets into the kingdom of heaven unless they're born again. Okay. Um, and again, a big difference between Arminianism and Calvinism is they think that you can be born again by choice. You have the ability to be born again by choice. The Calvinist says, no, you do not have the ability. You're spiritually dead. So unless God makes you alive spiritually, you will never choose him. Okay. Um, so regeneration precedes faith in Calvinism. In Arminianism, regeneration comes after faith. And I, I just, again, I just, 
I've never, I, I've never seen that. Even in, even when I've led people to Christ, it's interesting. Like I oftentimes, I, my method of salvation is a little weird. My, my me, it's personal evangelism is pretty weird. I, I'm almost hardcore trying to convince them not to become a Christian. I mean, I tell them, man, when you become a Christian, you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to do that. This is going to change this. This is going to change that. I'm always trying to scare them. And then if they still want it, then I realize they get it. It's like, oh, I'm not going to be on the throne anymore. Oh, I actually have to submit to God. Oh, I actually have to believe that he's the Lord of my life. And I'm not on the, you know, I'm not on the, I'm not the king or the queen anymore. Yeah. Now you get it. But too many people try to make it too easy in the sense of, oh, all you got to do, you know, just pray this prayer. Read this, you know, here, here's a little track. Read this, you know, pray this prayer, do this. And, you know, especially little kids. I mean, if you have a room of little kids, how many of you want to, I hear this all the time. People say, I hear Sunday school, how many of you want to go to heaven? Everybody raises their hands. You know, of course they want to go to heaven. Well, all you got to do is pray this prayer. They don't understand what sin is and what, what it means to be before a holy God. I mean, I, I think we're too quick to rush into a weak, cheap gospel than to really talk about what this means and what this is. And so I like to see, I mean, one of the things I always like to see in somebody getting saved is there tends to be a brokenness there. As a matter of fact, I love it when I see people weep over their sin. Mm -hmm because that tells me they're really taking it seriously. Um, That's a lot of hard work. It is, yeah. it is, yeah. And again, usually it takes a lot of time. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a quick deal. But I see people all the time who sort of feel like they have their fire insurance, but they really could give a rip about the church. They could give a rip about what God wants, you know, they, they, but they prayed a prayer at a camp, you know, when they were six and, and they're living with their girlfriend and doing drugs and whatever. And it's, and it's like, yeah, I'm a Christian. You know, I love Jesus, but I could give a rip about the church. And I'm like, well, I don't know. You know, I, I question it. <laughs> you know, I really question it. Yeah.